This time I'll call this meeting of the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society to order. I'm Richard Conkle. I'm the society president. Do we have any first time guests? Okay, and your name? Uh, Debbie Hummel. Debbie Hummel, okay. My mother's neighbor is named Debbie Hummel also, but you're not the same person, so. Uh, was she a principal? Yes. I work with her. Okay. <laughs> so we, we all we all have a, a double ganger, I guess, yes. is what it amounts to. Okay, well, glad to have you with us today. And at this time, I think we'll have Erica Rumpels maybe standing in for our secretary to give us minutes from the last meeting. Good afternoon. So these are the minutes from October the 3rd program meeting. Richard Kunkel introduced the Sunday, October 3rd program meeting, which was held at the New York History Center. The meeting was held in person and via Zoom. Minutes of our previous meeting were unavailable, but will be reviewed at the next meeting. Our treasurer, Margaret Berg, noted that our last program held on August 29th at the History Center was presented by Aaron McMichael of the Pennsylvania State Archives, Absolutely. who introduced and explained the society, to the society audience the improvements to the archive website, especially those related to online research. She then provided the treasurer's report as follows. September 1st opening balance was $18,735.82. New receipts covering $255 for membership renewals, $30 for new family membership and a donation, uh, $20 donation and $220.50 in publication sales for a total of $525.50. Since there were no disbursements, our new balance is as of that time was $19,261.32. Membership is as follows, 140 regular members, two new members, 22 life members, and 16 family members. York History Center librarian and archivist, Nicole Smith, had given a rundown of the upcoming October activities, starting with the notice that the 2021 Journal of, Amer of York County Heritage is now available in the gift store and online. The second Saturday event is, uh, is Jim Abel speaking on the history of the PA National Guard. The annual Oyster Festival on October 17th is only available this year with pre-ordering and pickup off-site this, this year. October 20th Central War, Civil War Roundtable is presented by Leon Reed and is titled No Greater Calamity, North-South Conflict, Succession and the session and the onset of the Civil War. Jonathan Stair, our Vice President, read a letter of appreciation from our recent speaker, Aaron McWilliams, again of the, of the PA uh, State Archives. Jonathan reminded visit viewers of our next upcoming program schedule. On November the 7th, Scott Mingus will be speaking on churches and chaplains of. York County during the Civil War. There is no December meeting. And on January 2nd, 2020, Mark Shermeyer of, will be speaking on the Dempwood family of architects and their architecture in York County. The rest of the scheduled programs, including uh, Tom Gibson's off-site program at the Continental Courthouse, can be seen on our website at S cpgs.org. Jonathan also noted that our meetings are now starting at 2.30. And then from then we have our guest speaker, Nicole Smith of the, the York uh, County Archives or the York County uh, History Center delivered an overview of the center's library entitled Genealogical Resources in the Library and Archives. 
the Aramidorians in the first paragraph? You said, you said Michael. Did you I misspoke. Okay. Yes. Okay. You're okay. correct. Yes, okay. I do. Thank you. Any uh, any ed edits to those minutes? I think we just have the Aaron McWilliams instead of McMichaels, but it's <laughs> yeah. correct in the actual thing. If not, then they stand to prove this red. Our treasurer, Margaret Berg, she has a longtime friend from California visiting with her, so she's not here today, and we do not have a treasurer's report. So in January, she will give us uh, double treasurer's reports. And I, does anyone have a membership report? Usually Margaret has that, and I don't believe anyone has that. So the membership report will wait until then as well. Um, at this time, I'll have Nicole Smith, librarian and archivist from the York County History Center to give us news from, uh, from here. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, welcome and thank you all for coming today. If you're watching from home, uh, please type any questions in the chat feature or comments on Facebook. This webinar is being live streamed on the History Center Facebook page and recorded and will be available on the History Center YouTube channel. A couple of things happening at the History Center real quick. Uh, we have a new virtual exhibit. It's called Energy Awaits, the Smith Putnam Wind Turbine and the Beginning of Modern Wind Energy in America. That's on our website. Uh, this week, we are being, we're part of a regional history consortium, which includes um, Cumberland, Franklin, Adams County, and Carroll County, Maryland. The topic is historic railroads, and um, our representative uh, on Tuesday night at seven will be Sam Dorn and Tina Charles speaking on how railroads influenced York's African American community. On November 13th, our second Saturday speaker is Tracy Larson, who's going to be speaking about um, how to use family lore as a basis for a historical novel. November 13th is also Articles of Confederation Day at our colonial sites, where you can uh, experience tours, family activities, reenactors, and more for free. On November 17th, we have a webinar um, this is the uh, Civil War Roundtable webinar. Speaker is Michael Jesperger. Uh, topic is A Soldier's Civil War Christmas. So thank you all very much. And uh, for more information about programs at the History Center, please visit our website, yorkhistorycenter.org. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our Vice President, Jonathan Stair, who will update us on upcoming meetings and introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Before I talk about future programs, I just want to mention that the latest issue of the National Genealogical Society's magazine has articles about the 1950 census, which will be released in April next year. So if you're interested in using the census, there's a very good article about what's on the census and another good article about how to access the census in uh, when there's no index, because it will not initially it will not be indexed. So uh, if you uh, want to read those articles, uh, Nicole tells me that the Historical Society here does have that in, in the library, that particular magazine. As far as future programs, keep in mind, we never have a meeting in December, so there will be no meeting next month. Our next meeting will be on January the 2nd, right after New Year's Day. And that our speaker will be Mark Shermeyer, who's president of uh, SAA Architects. And um, he's gonna be speaking about the Dental family and their architecture here in York County. On February the 6th, that's the second month of the first Sunday, Chip Kaufman, who had, speaks at Ali, and also I think he's a adjunct lecturer at the York College. We'll be talking about the history of Celtic languages and their expressions in Pennsylvania. He's also going to do something which I find interesting. He's going to tell us a few of the Pennsylvania place names or phrases that have Celtic origins. So you might want to come and hear, hear about that. I'm not going to give you the rest of the year except for the March program. 
and this is particularly for people who are watching from home. Our March program will be presented by Brad Emick, who is a master craftsman of 18th century uh, firearms, prim primarily what we call Kentucky or Pennsylvania rifles. He is going to be bringing some tools. I think he's going to be bringing some of the rifles he has made here. And he said, it's better if you come in person than to see it online because he wants to share that with us. He is a nationally recognized uh, rifle maker. So this is going to be a special opportunity for us to see somebody who practices a craft and um, he does it the way it was done in the 18th century. So uh, it, it should be a very good program. And I'll talk in January, I'll talk about the rest of the next year's programs. However, they should be available on our website. Our speaker today should not be of any stranger to us. Uh, his, his is Scott Mingus, who probably is best known to most of us as the proprietor of the Cannonball blog, mostly about Civil War stuff, York County stuff, uh, Underground Railroad things. I was just browsing through the bookshop out here, and there's a whole shelf of books that were written by Scott out here. So uh, his primary interests have been the Civil War, Underground Railroad, and, and related topics. And he's also helped me a couple times in, over the years with my research. Today he's going to be talking about York County Civil War uh, churches and chaplains. And so let's give a welcome to Scott Mingus. Thank you very much. Appreciate it very much, John. Thank you for coming today. I want to talk to you today about obviously a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And that's the Civil War in York County. As we all know, York County was one of the places in Pennsylvania, one of five counties that was involved in the Gettysburg campaign. One out of every seven Confederate soldiers that fought at Gettysburg came through York County. One out of every eight or nine uh, Union soldiers that fought at Gettysburg also came through York County. So this was a significant place during the Civil War. The home front though here was a mixed bag. York County, like many areas near the border, had a lot of people that were friendly to Southern causes. They also had many people who were devoutly devoted to Abraham Lincoln and the Northern cause. Uh, that was not atypical at all of the counties that were in the border regions of Pennsylvania. But we're gonna to talk today about some of the aspects of the churches that were involved here in the home front. We also want to discuss the background in terms of uh, some of the chaplains that we sent here from uh, York County. So if you look at the county's background, in the 1860 census, we're talking about the 1850 census, in 1860, York County had 68,000 people. This was a fairly sparsely populated county. There was large stretches, of course, where there weren't much but farms, uh, and very large farms in some cases. 68,000 people though, made this one of the more populated counties in the South Central uh, Tier. Lord York today, as it was then during the Civil War, the largest town between Baltimore and Harrisburg, about 8,605 people or so, according to the 1860 census. There are only other two communities in York County that in 1860 were a thousand or more people. Uh, that was Hanover as well as Wrightsville. Uh, and again, most of the community, other communities we're familiar with in York County were a couple hundred to 300 people at the most in those cases. As with most of South Central Pennsylvania, farming and milling were the two major uh, employers. There was obviously a, a growing industrial base in York. Uh, with a number of, there was a paper mills in York, there were a number of iron foundries, particularly out by the river. There were obviously people manufacturing rail cars, uh, folks manufacturing carriages and wagons, things of that sort. So this was just starting to emerge from a purely ag agrarian economy like it had been for much of the first hundred years of the population, but was now on the cusp of becoming an industrial place. If you look at this great picture, this is from the 1850s, it shows some of the skyline of York, what it would have looked like uh, in 1852, 1853 time frame. But in particular, I call your attention to the fact that what was dominating the skyline were churches. Uh, and these are just some of the churches that were in York. This is Christ Lutheran, of course, still there. Uh, St. Patrick's Catholic right here. St. Paul's, you'll see the spire there. 
This is a German Reformed Church. Here's the Moravians Church right here. Here's the Quaker Church, uh, the Friends Church, of course, with no spire or adornment. And here's a Methodist Church here. These are not, of course, all the churches in York, but it gives you a feeling as you're coming down George Street. Ballpark, of course, will be right about here. On uh, today's world, that, of course, is Tudor's Creek. Uh, but it gives you an idea of just what a visitor coming from Harrisburg, for example, on what was then the turnpike, George Street, uh, from Harrisburg into York, would have seen. And again, churches would have been dominating their view. This is the Church of York. If you look at this, is the 1860 map of York County uh, for the Library of Congress, the Shearer and Lake map that I use extensively for my research. And again, you can see all of these churches scattered throughout York. Uh, African Methodist Church, uh, a number of other ones uh, scattered throughout the town. Uh, and my research would indicate back in those days, there were actually far more churches in York than there were bars, uh, which may have changed, I think, over the, over the last uh, few years. But at this point in time, a couple other points to, to mention. This is the York Fairgrounds, which existed then uh, at the intersection of King and Queen Street. Uh, it did not exist on Carlisle like we've had throughout our lifetime. So this is the old North Fairgrounds. This right here, alley still exists. That's Fair Alley uh, in today's world, which was again, the old entrance to the old fairgrounds. Uh, so the next time you're in that section of King and Queen Street, if you happen to spot Fair Alley, you'll notice that again, and you'll remote, no, it's not because it was a nice fair little avenue. Of course, it was because of the fairgrounds itself. But these churches dominated York society. Most Yorkers at least attended church services occasionally during a year. Some people, of course, were far more uh, devoted or devout or were uh, more involved in their church uh, ceremonies. But most people tended to at least attend one uh, church. Some people attended more than one, depending on their uh, predications and where they were. Now, if we look at, as we all know, the start of the Civil War, came from a number of different factors, uh, particularly slavery, sectional divide over states' rights, things along those lines. Uh, but it was that issue of slavery as the one that started breaking apart the churches of America. Wasn't any of the other issues we talk about that uh, were involved in sectional discord, but it was really the issue of slavery that started getting the churches to split apart. And in fact, 1837, the Church of the Brethren nationwide, much of which, of course, was Pennsylvania dominated at that point in time. The Church of the Brethren became one of the first denominations to actually say, if you are going to maintain your ownership of another human being, you're out. Now, the Moravians, the Religious Society of Friends, Quakers, etc., cetera, uh, a number of other denominations have long held this same view. But the Church of the Brethren in 1837, again, becomes the first, shall we say, mainline church, uh, at least in this region, uh, since the Quakers uh, made their declaration uh, that generation before, to basically say it's either in or out. There is no middle ground. You are either a slave owner or you are gone. Uh, the opposite of that. And over time, over the next few years, you can start seeing other denominations start following suit. Uh, in many major American uh, denominations, Methodist, back, I grew up in United Methodist Church. That's one denomination that split apart and came back together by and large. Uh, the Baptists never did come back together. Southern Baptist Church remains independent from the American Baptists, et cetera, uh, to this day. The Presbyterians, Lutherans, uh, and even new denominations were being formed. Uh, my wife and I are members of the Nazarene denomination, which is an offshoot of the Church of Wesleyan. Uh, to some degree, but the Wesleyans left the, Method the Methodist Church, again, over the issue of slavery. Uh, and even the Vatican, uh, Pope Gregory was in, uh, the Pope at that time. Now, he and the Vatican actually officially condemned the slave trade, but it was interesting. There was a lot of money flowing in from Catholics in the South in particular, and the last thing the Pope could actually do was interfere with the American slave trade. Uh, he didn't want to do that, of course. Uh, and so he basically never, never ordered any of the churches in the United States to uh, free their slaves. Uh, he did condemn the international transport of slaves. So he was very much against the spread of slavery, trying to bring it into new territories. But, you know, he just, Maryland, Louisiana in particular, just like kind of, okay, you're okay, we're going to ignore this. 
And of course, this is uh, York's Catholic Church at the time. This is a Wagner print uh, from here at White uh, HC, uh, YCHC. And again, it shows the, uh, the local, this was the largest of the Catholic churches in the county at the time. Uh, and again, because Pennsylvania had actually banned the slave trade back um, with the Gradual Emancipation Act of 1780, uh, there were no slaves living in York Borough at the time of these, where the churches were starting to split apart. Uh, in fact, the last slave in York County had died on the Forney farm down in Hanover in the early 1840s, uh, owned by Mark's uh, Forney. So if we look, whoops, missed one. Here's Charles Hutchins. Charles Hutchins was the uh, pastor of the Presbyterian Church here in York. Hutchins' story is very typical of a lot of churches along the border region. And I grew up in Southern Ohio, so when I include talking to the border region, I also included Kentucky and Missouri, uh, as well as Maryland, of course, and Southern Pennsylvania, in this whole border region between North and South. Much of these regions that had uh, uh, economic, familial, as well as social uh, discourse between the borders, if you will, Southern Ohio was very much uh, related to West Virginia and Kentucky, uh, Kentucky and Indiana and Illinois, you get the picture. And of course here in Pennsylvania, it was Pennsylvania and Maryland. And so this whole border issue over what's going to happen with this issue of slavery became really important. And Hutchins will later write, I'm compelled to leave this place. He leaves York. He will actually resign his pastor and leave because of the different, whoa, what happened there? Okay. Uh, I like this quote, uh, different opinions on slavery issues. Our folks, the members of Presbyterian Church are thoroughly Southernized. I have not preached on slavery, but two or three times in nearly four years. What brought matters to a crisis? I preached a sermon on the position of our church, which I had prepared by appointment of Presbyterian. The subject of slavery was discussed, but the Democrats called it political. So this guy actually takes precautions where he goes to the general church fathers the Presbyterian, and says, this is what I want to say. What should I say here? And they almost, they pretty much put the words in Reverend Hutchins' mouth and say, this is what the Presbyterian Church believes as a whole on it. And so he basically repeats the denominationals creed, if you will, and people in York are like, no, 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 we don't want to hear that. And so Hutchins resigns. He's pretty frustrated if you want to read the rest of his letter. He's like, I only preached two or three, you know, this is in four years. He's only talking two or three times on the issue of slavery. And that was enough to make him unpopular in his own uh, church. When 1860 election, shortly after Hutchins was elect, uh, the presidential vote here in York County, you can see the uh, Democratic ticket, ready ticket it was called, a fusion of votes between John Brackenridge and uh, Stephen Douglas. Uh, will carry the county, but Lincoln does fairly well. I mean, in 1856, John C. Fremont did not do very well in York County, but he was the first Republican to ever run in this region. Lincoln does reasonably well, um, but the county is fairly interesting. If you look at the whole idea, Amy Parker, young New York uh, member of the Religious Society of Friends with his upbringing, but Amy Parker says York was distinctively Northern but not bitterly anti-Southern, which is kind of an interesting phrase. It's a Northern town, but they didn't really hate the South. I grew up in, a in an area that hated the South. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of anti, and very violent anti, anti-Confederate, anti-Southern sentiment in Northern and Central Ohio, where I grew up. And that was, that was go to Southern Ohio, deep Southern Ohio was Copperhead country. But those folks were bitterly anti-Southern, including most of my own family that were, devout abolitionists and devout Yankees. Well, here in York, because you're so close to Baltimore, they're not bitterly anti-Southern. You know, there's a lot of anti-Southern feeling, particularly in northern parts of the county, et cetera, but it's not really bitter. It's not like Marylanders and Pennsylvanians don't like each other. Now, what's fascinating about this comment is Maryland and Pennsylvania had fought a war a few generations before called Cresap's War over the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania. And we were actually shooting each other at one point. Within just a few generations, Marylanders and Pennsylvanians were getting along quite swimmingly. 
at least when, uh, in most cases. But here's the book in 1860, because it talks a lot about the county's makeup. The closer you were to the river and the closer you were to uh, Harrisburg, the more likely you were to be a Lincoln supporter. The farther you were uh, to the south, the less likely you were. Anon Township, for example, cast 174 votes for the Democrats and two for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and she got farther north, Cadoris, North Cadoris, Jackson. You started getting more and more of Republican support to the point where you got up in Conawago, for example, Manchester, which was united at the time. Uh, it says Warrington, but it's Warrington. Uh, but that was basically Lincoln, strong Lincoln country. And the churches tended to reflect that. If you were a small country church in Southern York County, typically you would have more congregants that were anti-Lincoln in their feelings or ambivalent towards Lincoln. Let's not forget the fact, when we talk about political positions in York County, you really had three choices, Democrat, Republican, or I don't care. And I don't care tended to win in a lot of these elections uh, where folks are just like, okay, you know, just leave me alone. I just wanna live my life my way. Uh, that seemed to be fairly common. Now, up in Warrington Township, one of the Quaker ladies, uh, Libby Jane LaRoe, uh, started talking early in the war. Uh, she writes a letter to her sister out in Kansas. Uh, is there any talk of war there in Kansas? There is considerable talk of it here in York County. Oh, I wish they would settle and not have any more fuss about it. I know if they would have had the right feeling about them, they wouldn't feel like spilling their own brother's blood, as we are all brothers and sisters. We have a one father, but I think he won't own those wicked ones as his children <laughs> before they have him doing his will. I don't think he wants anyone to be slain in that way. I don't think they're doing his will by killing one another. That is an interesting quote. It's one of the best letters I've ever seen from a York County and talking about the attitude towards war. This, of course, a Northern York County, so she would have been leaning more heavily Republican or pro-government in her uh, tend to, to thinking. Well, I like this. She's trying to bring in the whole futility of the war to begin with. I mean, we're talking about 700,000 people that died, of course. And very early on, she recognizes and she basically says, I don't think God is taking sides here. We're just going to kill each other. And this isn't a good thing, necessarily. But as war concerns keep growing, this is Harry Gladwell, who attended the church in Seven Valleys. Wherever men belong to, the two parties existed. Arguments, disputes, controversies arose over the fallacy of going to war, and neighbors were not quite as amiable as they used to be. Yeah, that's probably true today. You know, bring up the topic of war or politics, or in my case, football, and you're going to get people who are going to violently disagree with you uh, from that standpoint. That hasn't changed, despite the fact we're like four or five generations away from Harry Gladwell's time. Uh, those feelings still exist. I love that quote. Obviously, as the war begins, there's an intense reaction in York County. This is Francis Hagen, who at the time the start of the war was a pastor of the Raven Church, uh, just southwest of where we are today. Uh, and he talks about it's a day of great excitement. Look at this. The sad tidings of civil war begun. Now, reaction across the North and South to the Civil War's commencement was decidedly mixed. In many areas, there was ardent rush to join the armies, respective armies of the North and South. There were plenty of people that were perfectly willing to shoot each other over the various issues that existed between the, the new Confederate States of America and the traditional United States of America. But the Moravians, a denomination that was one of the very first ones to outlaw slavery, to really talk about peace, how to cooperate among people. He says, sad tidings. He was right, obviously, as we know that the war is going to progress and it's going to be really ugly really quickly. But Lincoln's going to call him to arms. Here in York County, we're going to uh, get uh, close to 6,200 men or so are going to serve in the United States Army uh, during, from York County. Uh, the average soldier, at least in the Hanover region, according to Dr. Mark, Mark Snell's research, was about 24 years old and made 343 bucks. The officers were older, they were worth a lot more money. Uh, so this was kind of a rich man's war being fought by poor men to a degree, uh, particularly early on in the war, where most of these guys bought their commissions or they were elected to their first office as a lieutenant 
or a captain or uh, even a, to some degree a major because of who they were in their communities. They had the means, they had the wealth to actually raise that. As such, many of these were the leading pillars of some of the churches of York County that were involved. Thousands of men are going to leave their homes. They're going to leave their churches. They're going to leave their wives, their sweethearts, their families, and they're going to go off and join the armies. Uh, but a lot of people aren't still aren't quite convinced that warfare is the right solution. Uh, there are documented 156 conscious objectors. I think, Jonathan, you did some work on this uh, over the years. In fact, this really nice work. Uh, and I think I got this number from you, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, by 156 uh, objectors, uh, this photograph that Paul McClure took um, shows the, uh, uh, the church uh, on Philadelphia Street, of course. But Mennonites, Quakers, Dunkers, a lot of these denominations are the ones that the government, at least in York County, the U.S. government recognized as being legitimate uh, conscious objectors. For a lot of other people across the United States that wanted to skip army service, uh, but they're weren't affiliated with one of these denominations, or at least out in my home area in Ohio, uh, there were people who were suddenly flocking to some of these churches to join because they thought, I can get out of the army service. All I have to do is go to a Quaker church a few times a year and maybe they'll take me in. So again, this is another great view of York, uh, showing again York skyline dominating here, of course, this in uh, Christ Lutheran, and this is the square. So this is. Market Street, this is George Street, going down through here, courthouse, of course, right back here. But the first Baptist church was on South George Street. Uh, as the war begins, was a temporary barracks for the Duquesne Graves. Uh, this was a unit of soldiers that came here to York. We had a big United States Army camp uh, on that fairgrounds. Remember, I showed you the picture earlier that showed the fairgrounds down in the southeastern part of the uh, borough that has existed then. The Duquesne Grays are one of several thousand United States soldiers, mostly from Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, some from Massachusetts, that come here to be trained in York. Uh, this is an overflow, if you will, for the larger training camps in Harrisburg, uh, Camp Curtin. Uh, but the York camp becomes a, what Camp Winfield Scott, or Camp Scott for short, becomes a significant training base. Well, there's so many men that flood into York that they start actually putting soldiers up in civilians' houses. They don't have enough bedding. They don't have enough uh, medical facilities. They don't have enough support, places to feed uh, these soldiers. Because again, you know, York's a town of 8,605 people, and we have a board of 6,000 new soldiers coming into this town. So you've almost doubled the population of York, particularly the adult population of York has actually more than doubled because you've now got these people. The churches start responding, the women of York start responding, the men who are in the service respond, and they start helping. And in this case, George Slaysman, who was the pastor of this church, um, you know, when these soldiers leave, uh, when they finally are put on a train at New York's train station on North Duke Street, they're gonna be sent down to Virginia, and they're gonna see a lot of hard fighting. A lot of hard fighting over the next uh, couple of years, but these guys want to pay the church, and the church is like, "We're not going to charge you. We're a church, you know. In effect, we do this out of love and out of the goodness of our hearts." What they ended up doing, though, was buying a Bible, a very large pulpit Bible, and they gave to this church, and they still have it all these years later. Uh, that uh, pulpit Bible still exists. They were given by the Pittsburgh soldiers. This is one of several uh, images that exist of the York Fairgrounds being used as Camp Scott. Again, that's uh, Fair Avenue, was somewhere back up in here, at the intersection of King and Queen Streets. Now, the first two chaplains to arrive here are not York Countyans. Uh, they're A.J. Marks and A.M. Stewart. They came from Pittsburgh with the Duquesne Grays and other soldiers who arrived from the western part of Pennsylvania via rail uh, into Harrisburg and then down through Emmitsville on the Northern Central. Uh, they get out of the trains, of course, here in York, and are going to spend time training. At this very early stage in the Civil War, soldiers did not have formal chaplains. So if you wanted a military service, if you will, you brought the preachers with you, 
but they weren't officially designated by the government. They just kind of went along on their own, uh, paid for by themselves or by free will offerings from their churches back home, or they found housing in somebody in York, usually of their denomination, uh, or they're close to their denomination who would take them in. Um, but a lot of these new soldiers, Abraham Lincoln had called for 75,000 new volunteers. Now keep in mind, the United States Standing Army started the Civil War is only a few thousand men. Uh, but this war is warfare on a scale the United States had never seen before. And so Lincoln has called for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion within weeks after the firing on Fort Sumter in April and then in May of 1865, 61, uh, Lincoln is raising these troops. So many of these guys, including several of my own ancestors were farm boys who honestly had never been away from the farm before. And here they are, the York, I mean, we may not recognize this, but York as 8,605 people started the war, this is a pretty big town. And a lot of these country boys from Ohio or from Western Pennsylvania, or from the mountains of central Pennsylvania or upstate New York, this is the largest town a lot of these guys had ever lived in. And they're gonna stay here for months and months on end. In fact, some of these regiments will not leave until March of 1862. So we're talking about in some cases, regiments that spent eight to nine months living in York. And they're away from home, they're 18, 19, 20, 25, 30 years old, many of them are single, uh, and they have all kinds of problems. Uh, hard liquor, gambling, profanity, petty thievery, loose women, desertion, brawling, murder. Uh, you know, and it's, it's typical of both sides, North and South. But a number of the leading clergy in the United States appeal to President Lincoln. Uh, at the same time, it's happening in the South with Jefferson Davis, uh, saying we need something more organized. And so Lincoln on May 4th, 1861, orders every single regiment, all these new soldiers had to appoint a chaplain. Uh, at least that's how they wanted them to. More importantly, the United States government was now going to pay for the preachers. You didn't have to raise their own money. They didn't have to have deputations back home. They had cash. Uh, and they, are, they had to be, number one, early on they had to be Christians. Later on they allowed Jewish. Uh, individuals, but at first they could not be Jewish, they had to be a Christian. Uh, and they made the same amount of money as an officer. They got $700 a year. Uh, but over time, that was cut back because they needed the money for more soldiers and the budget never got approved. So they started slashing the budget. And of course, the preachers are aware they started slashing among other places. Uh, now, the Confederates weren't nearly, again, the Confederates weren't nearly as organized. So they're paying their. Uh, 1020, and later, of course, that's cut to 600. Now, a lot of the print shops in the North started switching gears. Instead of printing novels and other books, they start printing religious tracts, Bibles, enough information for all of these soldiers. You get American Bible Society, people like that that still exist today are starting to do a significant amount of work. Uh, and then you start seeing some of the first and the youngest chaplain in the United States service. This guy, appropriately named George Pentecost. <laughs> I think there's no, no better name for a preacher that I could think of uh, than Pentecost. Uh, he is uh, 19 years old when he becomes a preacher. After the war, uh, some of you may know that Pentecost and Moody uh, are two of the people who found the Moody Bible Institute, which still exists in the Chicago area. Uh, Pentecost names kind of got left off over the years. It's really the Moody Bible Institute. But George Pentecost, 19 years old, can you imagine? 19 year old kid away from home, a preacher, you know, trying to preach to 35 year old grizzled veterans who may not necessarily want to hear from this kid. Uh, I got to admire him. Here's another chaplain uh, that you might recognize, at least the name. This is John Pierpont. He's the oldest chaplain. He's the 22nd Massachusetts. But look at his lineage, his kid. James Pierpont writes Jingle Bells in 1857. He fights the Confederacy. This guy's a devout Yankee in Boston, uh, an abolitionist. And the grandson is J.P. Morgan. We all know J.P. Morgan today, the financial uh, gurus, of course, John Pierpont Morgan, one of the great industrialists of America. But did you know J.P. Morgan's dad wrote Jingle Bells? And did you know that J.P. Morgan's grandpa was the oldest Civil War chaplain? And did you know, like so many other families, one Yankee, one Confederate. Uh, again, 
you know, split apart. In this case, I like the kids because of girls. He marries a girl from Georgia, lives in Georgia, and obviously doesn't ever want to come back up north because his wife didn't know necessarily wanted to do that. Uh, there are 2,154 chaplains that served the United States Army during the war, Methodist by far being the largest denomination. Now, this is the United States Army, Union Army, Presbyterians being second, Baptists on down the line. 11 chaplains are going to be killed in action. Four more will die of wounds uh, that they suffered during the war. So 15 of the 2154 chaplains to serve in U.S. service uh, are uh, oars to combat, if you will. Uh, now, here in York, uh, this is James Brown. Uh, he lived in Lancaster, uh, but he spends a lot of his adult life in York. Uh, he's the chaplain for the 87th Pennsylvania, which was one of York's largest uh, three-year regiments. It was formed in 1861 from mostly York Countyans with three companies from Adams County uh, involved as well. He later will be the chaplain of the United States Army Hospital in York. And James Brown will uh, I'll talk a little bit more about him later, but he will play a significant role in the life of the US Army Hospital. John Baird is the only known chaplain to kill himself. We don't know the background on that. He comes home from the army uh, and uh, drowns himself, in the, supposedly drowns himself in the Cadorce Creek. Uh, we don't know all the circumstances. Uh, there is some mystery about his uh, behavior as well there. Uh, also the 87th, I've been going through a whole string of chaplains. Uh, I like this guy, David Christian Everhart. He's a dentist. Uh, now that's an odd career choice. You start being a dentist and decide instead of drilling people's teeth, I'm gonna save their souls. So he started working as a pastor. Uh, now he's with the 87th Pennsylvania at the Second Battle of Winchester. Of course, I wrote, co-wrote a book on the Second Battle of Winchester with my good friend, Eric Wittenberg. And we detail in that book, the demise of the 87th Pennsylvania. Uh, that regiment suffered horrendous, horrendous numbers of men who were taken prisoner of war. They were forced to march from Winchester, Virginia, all the way up the valley to Stanton. Uh, where they were actually put on train cars, sent to Libby Prison in Richmond, and from there, many of these guys were sent to South Carolina, and some of the enlisted <coughs> men ended up in Andersonville Prison in Georgia. Uh, but Christian Eberhardt uh, actually gets a tremendous impact on his fellow prisoners of war. So he's one guy, the old adage that if your life yields you lemons, make lemonade. He does that where he finds a brand new fertile ministry among these boy, men and boys from York and Adams County that are now in Southern prisons and places they never expected to be. Uh, and with lots of time on their hands, the mind can start playing games and he was there to minister to a number of their needs. Now the United States uh, in 1861, we've got the chaplain service, but it's really not enough. Uh, because there's so many men, you know, by then the United States armies are almost 200 and some thousand men combined by the fall of 1861 uh, across the country. And you've got so many troops and just not enough support. And so the United States Christian Commission is founded by an organization we recognize, the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA. Long before the village people ever sang about the YMCA, these guys were heavily involved in helping the soldiers of the United States. Uh, their job was to assist the chaplains. They also did a lot of, they took over some of the chaplain's duties. If somebody was sick, they would pray with them. They would read to them. Many of these are farm boys who can't read or write. And so this uh, Christian commission would provide stenographers, if you will, who would uh, help the individuals write and dictate letters, sometimes the last letter if they were dying, back home. And they would make them in flowery language and make them in nice handwriting so that hopefully the people back home could read them. They would also provide reading materials to the wounded soldiers or the soldiers away from home in the camps. And the Christian Commission uh, becomes very, very active throughout the war. And a large number of American celebrities at the time, including Louisa May Alcott, uh, well known, of course, for the author of Little Women, are quite active in the USCC throughout the Civil War. 
Now, John Gall is the guy who's in charge of York. He's a delegate in Baltimore, uh, but his responsibilities include York. We did not have a USCC chapter here in York. There was one in Gettysburg, uh, but there wasn't one here in York. Uh, and so Gall, who came here to York, he drew support from all the local churches. The UCCC was, uh, USCC, was non-denomination. This was again, pastors and the, and the YMCA back, you know, but it was interdenominational or non-denominational. And so all their funding, all their support came from the local churches. So one of Gaul's big missions was to come here to York frequently, came here quite often on the train. And if you read the newspapers that are here at YCHC on the uh, microfish, uh, you will find quite often uh, that Gaul's up here preaching at various churches, you know, all those different churches that showed you earlier in York. Gaul hit most of them, uh, and he's trying to get funding from the local churches to again expand this USCC uh, uh, ministry. Uh, and one of the churches he comes to is John Beck's German Reformed Church. Again, yeah, it's a Louis Miller from YCHC. Now, Beck is a York native, uh, went to Franklin and Marshall, then known as Marshall College. Uh, he was the delegate at Gettysburg. Uh, so John Gall, of course, was in Gettysburg, uh, was in uh, Baltimore. This guy was in Gettysburg. He also worked in Hagerstown as well. Uh, this guy's kind of interesting. So he preaches 5,000 sermons. Nine, he has, I love his stats. He does 966 baptisms in his life, 475 weddings, 481 funerals. And he's like, uh, you know, I had the good fortune to marry, marry almost as many people as I buried. And it brought far more kids into the world than I did either. Uh, so this guy's kind of fascinating. But this is his church on West Market Street. Uh, obviously, the German Reformed Church. Uh, this is another thing that was going on in the Civil War era where churches, particularly those German denominations, were trying to decide, do we stay speaking the mother tongue? Because younger generations in the United States in the 1850s and 60s were speaking English. Uh, and so in the countryside, a lot of the old timers still spoke German, in fact, well into the 20th century. But the closer you were to York or Wrightsville or Hanover, or even Dillsburg and Dover, some of the other communities, you started seeing more and more churches having to have English services. And they started actually splitting. So the German folks who wanted the traditional service in German would have their own service and other folks would have English services. I actually lived for 23 years in Northeastern Ohio. Uh, there was a little village near us called Fairport Harbor and Fairport Harbor still had services in Finnish uh, because the Finnish immigrants that came over after World War II wanted their own churches in their own language. And so as far as I know, they may still be speaking Finnish on some services. But just gives you the idea, this is not a phenomenon that went away in the 1850s or 60s, this idea of speaking the mother tongue continued. But here in York, uh, you know, this is now Zion, uh, the English church uh, is, now Zion, uh, is now Trinity, and the German church is now Zion United Church of Christ. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how some of these churches sort of came about. Uh, this again would have been the German Reformed Church, isn't there, Lily Wagner from YCHC. Uh, I photographed a book that I bought from YHC to get some of these pictures for the presentation today. Uh, this is St. Paul's Lutheran. That's in the corner of King and Beaver. And this is actually a distant relative of mine. Uh, my original spelling of my name is M-E-N-G-E-S. Uh, the Mingus Mills people here in York County were from Ebersbach, Germany, which is my hometown. Uh, just we left a generation before them and went to upstate New York where that generation came to York County. Uh, so I have some kinship with the Minguses here uh, locally. And this is J.H. Mingus. Uh, but look at his, <laughs> he's not messing around. All Democrats and rebels, he preaches. That's a pretty bold statement to make in the streets of York where C.J. Hutchins had already been thrown out of the Presbyterian Church here in York for just hinting, hinting that the Democrats were in favor of slavery, the Republicans weren't. This guy stands up in his pulpit and boldly says, all Democrats are rebels. Well, that's not true either. That's kind of an over-exaggeration. Um, actually, this is a thing uh, this is uh, Bond's picture that took over for him. Uh, but finally, uh, uh, William Bond is actually chased out of Winchester with the clothes on his back. Uh, and this guy, 
Brought the engine and joins the militia in 1863, and he's here on the square in York as the Confederates are approaching York, drilling with a wooden gun with a lot of the members of this congregation. These guys weren't pacifists by any stretch of the imagination. These guys are ardently pro-Union. So in the middle of the town, somewhat of a mixed bag, uh, obviously this church, you know, St. Paul's Lutheran, was devoutly Republican. I mean, most of these people in this church were very strong Lincoln supporters, unlike some of their churches down the street. Uh, this was the old Methodist church, uh, Methodist Episcopal church, corner of Philadelphia and Duke. David Shook, a strong Union man, uh, but he, he preaches an in-between gospel. I think the South should be left alone to do what the people want to do. I'm against war of any kind, and I want to loss of how any man professes to be a Christian to engage in such a murderous act. Okay, that's almost almost smacks of a Quaker or a Moravian, you know, saying we don't like war, this is a murderous act. And what happens to this guy? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> the people in New York are a little thrilled. The people in New York are so exceedingly ignorant they couldn't tell right from wrong, but you were later. That's a pretty strong statement to make about your church and the people of your community. Um, and he thought the South should be recognized as an independent country. And Jeff Davis was truly the president of an independent country with as much power as Abraham Lincoln had. In a town with, again, very decided views like York, uh, this was too controversial. For his own congregation as well. Uh, and I like uh, after he after they voted again. And I like this. They vote against him and say, we're just not gonna pay you. You don't have to leave. We're not gonna pay you anymore, <laughs> which is kind of hint, hint. Uh, we might want you to take off, Mr. Show. Uh, and he finally takes a hint and he does leave. Uh, but one of his members says, hence the man that sympathizes with Jeffries and Davis in rebellion is morally just as much a rebel as the chief of the sum of all villainies. Speaking about the dear departed pastor. Now, I'm not sure many churches have lost pastors over the years. I'm not so sure many of them would ever acquaint them to a chief of all villainies. Uh, but in this particular case, that is what they uh, called Reverend Show. Uh, now, I mentioned the U.S. Army Hospital in New York. This was a uh, flat or a wayside market that used to exist on Penn Common. It's been gone for many years now. Somebody vandalized it. But this is the chaplain uh, chapel of the U.S. Army Hospital. It was here in York. These are some of the wards. This, of course, was the headquarters building. Uh, this is St. John uh, Mincer, who was the head of the hospital uh, in 1865. Uh, he's the major of that chief surgeon at that point in time. This again is what this would have looked like. But again, look at the spires. Again, you know, here's York's churches. There's would be a flag, of course, for the U.S. Army Hospital. And here's Beaver Street. There's St. Pat's. Here's Christ Lutheran again, and again, here's the uh, church, uh, this is the uh, uh, Presbyterian church. Uh, but he gave a disclaimer again, that even with the soldiers that were here in York, this was a community that still had a significant religious base. And James Brown was brought into the 87th Pennsylvania. I mentioned earlier that Brown was the chaplain throughout much of the Civil War. Uh, this is James Brown. Uh, and it's quite interesting. He talks about the ministry here at the hospital. During the course of the Civil War, more than 14,000 patients will come through, 14,000 different patients will come through the York Hospital. 193 of them die, making this one of the safest United States military hospitals in the entire country. Uh, this was a very well run, very efficient place with extremely talented staff. Uh, some of the finest doctors in the United States were involved in this hospital. In fact, Dr. Henry Palmer, who was the uh, uh, first and one of only two men to actually lead the U.S. Army Hospital in York, St. John Menzer being the other. Uh, but this man was so good that after the Civil War, uh, Dr. Henry Palmer was one of the co-founders of the American Medical Association. Uh, so he's an extremely talented man. We were fortunate enough to have him here in New York. Uh, but James Brown, who works with uh, Dr. Palmer, uh, he's given us spiritual guidance. Uh, we've been cheered by seeing quite a number turning to the Lord. Each month of this year, I've baptized some and added them to the general evangelical Christian church. To God's name be all the glory. We are quietly working on a desire and interest in the prayers of God's own people. Now keep in mind, this is, a, again, a non-denominational effort. The United States Army uh, chaplains, even though they may have come from a denomination, they were not allowed to proselytize. 
Uh, so if you were a chaplain of a regiment, or in this case, a United States Army facility, you could not bring people into your own church. So you had to baptize them in the general name of the church universal, or as he calls it, the Evangelical Christian Church. But that wasn't a denomination that was, you know, like saying that the holy, you know, universal or Catholic or whatever, you know, uh, phrase you want to use for the church as a whole. Here's the Mecca, the Mecca of Episcopal Church, as I mentioned earlier, showed that. But uh, after uh, showed left, uh, the Grand John Gear. Uh, now, Gear is related to the only Confederate general here, uh, but this guy is quite the opposite. They go from a guy who says Jefferson Davis should have just as much power for Abraham Lincoln to a Yankee. They bring in a guy who's a strong Lincoln supporter. Uh, and so he actually uh, will host the Methodist uh, denomination from. Baltimore and from uh, Harrisburg, et cetera. Uh, the regional conference is held here at this church and they will act here's uh, organization. They will send a letter to Abraham Lincoln supporting the president and the government. That's quite a change for the people of this church that just you know, one preacher ago were hearing from the pulpit that Jeff Davis was every bit as powerful. Uh, and, Lincoln, and this is Abraham, the only known letter I've ever seen. Nicole, I don't know if you've ever seen any more than this. This is a letter that Abraham Lincoln wrote to a preacher in York, Pennsylvania. I've never seen another letter written to a preacher in York, uh, but Lincoln actually replies to him. These kind words of approval come from so numerous a body of intelligent Christian people and so free from all suspicion of sinister motives are indeed encouraging. By the help of an all wise providence, I shall continue to do my duty. And I expect the continuation of your prayers, and he underlined that, for a right solution of our national difficulties. I like they didn't have to say the Civil War. Our national difficulties. How's that for understating a problem? Uh, and the restoration of our country to peace and prosperity. So Abraham Lincoln knows where York, Pennsylvania is. He certainly does. He's actually going to meet with A.B. Farmer uh, after the Gettysburg campaign. And he uh, tells him, I understand you, you know, you're the, you're the chap who was involved in the surrender of York. What do we, what we do with you? And Lincoln takes Barker to the Secretary of War and says, what do you think we ought to do with him the Secretary of War? Everyone stands and says, make him a colonel in the army. Uh, that was Lincoln's response to did York surrender? You know, make this guy a colonel. You know, this guy's a pretty brave dude. Uh, at least so he thought. Here again, the Presbyterian church this was brand new during the time. Uh, here's another church with a devoutly pro-Yankee. Uh, this is a pro-Lincoln denomination as well. Thomas Street, very fiery pastor. You ever want to read some interesting sermons? And you have some of Street's sermons here uh, at the York uh, County uh, History Center's library. He's actually arrested for getting in a fist fight. Can you imagine a preacher getting arrested? Arrested for a fist fight on the streets of a major American city. Tom Street didn't care. He's got some southern leaning geography book. Oh, I love this. A southern leaning geography book salesman. How's that for a description? We got a preacher and a geography book seller duking it out on the streets of York, only in York. All roads lead to York, including roads for Southern Bible or uh, Southern geography book salesmen. Uh, but in one of street sermons, in action is released from jail. I cannot endorse anyone who would curse the best government in the world. He's unrepentant. Basically says, I'm gonna duke it out with this guy again if he ever shows up in York one more time. Uh, this is from my own personal postcard collection, or C88. Uh, I collect pictures of York County and during the Civil War as a hobby, uh, and also to illustrate my books. Uh, this is Charles West Thompson uh, from my C88 collection. He's from the Episcopal Church, St. John's. Uh, his church is 140 Beaver Street. Uh, this guy's a poet. He probably exemplifies the kind of, let's not talk much about the war. Let's talk about your soul. Let's talk about your salvation. Let's talk about humanity and the goodness of man. Uh, so he kind of splits the difference throughout much of the war and gets away with it. Uh, June of 1863, as we know, the Confederates are coming into this region. Uh, and one of them, uh, this is the, the new Moravian pastor. His name is S. Morgan Smith. Uh, you talked earlier about having a, a talk coming up on the uh, 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 wind turbines. S. Morgan Smith actually was a North Carolinian. Uh, he married a York woman in 1862. He's preaching here at the Raven Church. Uh, as a rebel's commanding rights, uh, very few of prayer meeting. Uh, they're kind of coming in on two, uh, just three days from now. 
The town is in great excitement. Those who work hundreds of horses and property being carried through Franklin County and others. Rebels daily look for here, they will certainly come. Well, let's skip this. Well, let's move on here. Uh, well, as the rebels come in downtown Hanover, they're met by two preachers. Uh, Hanover City Council is gone. They went to take their horses off to better, better areas. And they kind of leave the civilians behind. And they have a committee of safety headed by two preachers. Uh, and so two of Hanover's pastors will actually meet with the Confederates in Hanover Central Square. Uh, and they will actually they'll talk. This is William Zebra. They're from the German church, uh, Julius Kurtz, uh, who was a young man who actually had an English church uh, at St. Paul's. Uh, these were the seven churches that were in Hanover at the time of the Civil War. Again, uh, from the 1860 map, they will all figure in the relief after the, uh, the Battle of Hanover. This is St. Matthew's, the old St. Matthew's Church. Uh, that was on West Chestnut Street. It was German speaking, as you mentioned. Uh, in 1863, they decided to vote uh, and start a brand new church. So St. Mark's Lutheran became the English speaking church associated with them. Uh, again, here is downtown York. Uh, here is Christ Lutheran, we talked about earlier. Uh, Christ Lutheran was an interesting church because they were a very strong supporter of Lincoln's war efforts. Uh, and they did quite, quite a ministry to the soldiers at the hospital just down the road from them. Uh, uh, finish off here. Oh, uh, when the rebels actually come in on Sunday, June 28th, the churches are still in session, some of them at least. Uh, but St. Paul's only has eight people in the service. This is one of the few churches that actually recorded the, the population or the congregation that day. Uh, you don't get eight people there in the entire church. York Moravian, uh, S. Morgan Smith again, says no church, they didn't meet at all, no uh, Sunday school without, because the rebels were here. Now, 500 Confederates are, are, are Camp uh, Penn Park in the U.S. Army Hospital, but a lot of these guys were guys that Smith knew, and some of them were his own congregants from his Moravian church in Forsyth County. Uh, as to their behavior, the rebels, I hardly know what to say. Upon the whole, it was much better than we expected. Our farmers lost hundreds of horses, Man, the money in the town was $100,000 in money and half as much in provisions, etc. But Morgan Smith will actually meet with a number of his former congregates, but he will come away thinking they were wrong, uh, that their ideas about uh, war against the North were totally unacceptable. Uh, this is Wrightsville. Uh, there are four churches in Wrightsville. Here's the African American uh, church here on Orange Street. Uh, there was another African American an older one that was around the corner that was not in use at the time of the Civil War. This is the main street. Then they end up moving to a new church uh, after the Civil War that's right actually here. They ripped this building down. But again, you see the Lutheran Church. Uh, here's the Presbyterian Church, and here's the Methodist Church, which is now actually a uh, Pentecostal church today. The Methodists are gone from that facility. But you an idea what Wrightsville's churches would have looked like. Uh, skip this. Uh, I'm just going to skip that one. Uh, as the Battle of Hanover goes on, it's interesting that the churches of Hanover will get deeply involved in the relief activities. Hanover becomes the largest battle in North County's history, uh, and the churches are deeply involved. Uh, Heron Gardner, in fact, who is the chaplain uh, or the doctor, first West Virginia Calvary. Every desired comfort is furnished in great abundance, every luxury, which the county abounds in great profusion. Is supplied by sympathetic people and ministered to the suffering wounded by devoted women. Hardly a response to the cause of humanity never came from more generous people than we have witnessed here. And again, this is the you know, these are the women of York County's churches that are stepping up, uh, that are you know working with the uh, ministry there. Uh, one last guy I want to talk about is Jacob Ott Miller. Now he's an interesting story. Uh, he's the German, uh, first reformed church. He was also the chaplain of the fire department. Now, he's a Virginian, but he grew up in Reading. Kind of an interesting mix. Born in Virginia, but his parents had moved to Reading. Uh, but he goes back home and marries a girl uh, from Virginia. Uh, he and his wife decide as a ministry, they're going to take over all those Gettysburg prisoners of war that were captured in the Battle of Gettysburg and taken to Fort Delaware. And so Reverend Miller and his wife and their congregation start writing letters, they make up care packages, they're doing all kinds of stuff to minister to these boys from Virginia and Georgia, Louisiana, Tennessee, all the places that the Army of Northern Virginia's soldiers have been captured at Gettysburg were from. Uh, and he and his wife leave again behind extensive documentation 
letters that they write back and forth to some of these uh, soldiers, uh, trying to encourage them. A lot of these, can you imagine a boy from Mississippi taking prisoner and spending his first winter in Pennsylvania at Fort Delaware along the Delaware River? That would be a culture shock to some of these guys, you know, to the brutally cold winters for them that they would have experienced here. Uh, final thing I want to talk about is the National Day of uh, Thanks. November of 1863, Abraham Lincoln has renewed the old practice of St. Adams and once started actually in York. And this plaque, of course, recognizes York as the place. This is on uh, Market Street, uh, in front of the parking garage, I think, or right by the parking garage. Uh, November of 1863, Lincoln renews the practice and sets apart the last Thursday of November, which we still uh, uh, celebrate. So here's Tom Street, the guy who beat up on the geography book sales. Tom Street's an interesting character. Uh, so he's going to preach the first Thanksgiving in New York. We are invited by Executive Lincoln, of course, to meet and worship the whole this day as one of Thanksgiving and praise. Probably we should do this, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the interesting part. He goes on this long discourse talking about the war and the Bible and all kinds of stuff. But his last closing comments, and I'll leave our audience with this tonight, Echoes to this day as an example. I actually read this quite often because the verse was he says, This is for many people I know should be your life motto. This for me. I, I read these words often. My brother, be true to the hour in which you live, whether it's civil war or now. Be true to the character of growing men. Be true to the great principles which claim your support. Be true to the responsibilities. The times lay upon you. So true, so manly, so brave, so unflinching, so patriotic, so Christian, that when you have gone into eternity, your children will think proudly of you, will love to recall your memory and make it their highest boast. In the war which tried their fathers, you were gloriously loyal, undoubtedly firm in upholding your country. You can have no better inheritance than that. Aren't those powerful words? The churches of York in 1863 left a message for the churches of York in 2021. Be true to who you are, be true to your families, and leave an inheritance that people will respect you for the rest of their lives. Thank you so very much for your time and attention today. Any questions for Scott? Any questions come in on the... Okay, thank you guys very much. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in a town actually in the Skingham County uh, outside of a town called Zanesville. And so many of you may pass through that on I 70. Uh, then I lived in Chillicothe, graduated from Miami of Ohio, lived near Cincinnati, and then lived 23 years in Mentor and Gainesville in Lake County, Ohio, before Gladfelder recruited me. When their vice president of research and development retired, and they needed a successor, cheaper, so they hired me to come come here to replace them. Did you do any uh, research on churches out beyond New York City and over in New York County? I mean, yeah, I did. I have to. Some of this is a great question. I mean, I, I mentioned a few of them in the, yeah. in the in presentation, particularly in Wrightsville, of course. Uh, but yes, I have. Uh, in fact. Uh, you know, Jim and McClure and I have just written a new book, which will include a, a sermon, a sermon, an essay that Jim did on the churches of, of York Borough. Um, I want to take what I've been reading about the other churches and maybe expand that into a chapter in a future, in a future book. Uh, there are a lot of churches in York County that did a lot of interesting things during the war. Some of these country churches, even though they were in the middle of anti lincoln country, you know, really, really stepped up to the plate and they were heavily involved in donating materials to the army, et cetera. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to spend a lot more time on, and Becky, you and I have chatted about this, is black churches in York County. Uh, they're underrepresented, I think, uh, in a lot of cases. A lot, there's not a lot of writings from some of them, unfortunately, uh, but certainly I think it's an area, you know, of intense interest that we need to understand more of. Okay, with that, I'll turn it back to you guys, uh, Richard or Jonathan or whoever.
Thank you very much, uh, Scott. And if um, no further questions, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you so great. much. Yeah. Very Thanks, interesting. Thank, thank you. you.